So the session today is on charitable status and CED, what you need to know. It's brought to you by the Canadian CED Network, a national network of local organizations and individuals working to create local economic opportunities that support an inclusive and sustainable economy. If you like the session today, consider becoming a member or signing up for a free e-newsletter. We'll provide more information on that later on. This session is part of a new webinar series Sednet has launched that offers monthly sessions on topics such as the versatility of co-ops, the resilience imperative, financial management for sustainability, and others. It also builds on the long experience of Sednet's International Committee, which has organized previous sessions over the past couple of years on community forestry in BC and Nepal, the co-construction of public policy for the social and solidarity economy in Mali and around the world, and the impact of fair trade are successful strategies for community tourism. All of these past sessions are on our website, and we'll provide links to them in a follow-up email. Today's session is divided into two parts. There you see a picture of me uh, um, nicely dressed up in the CRA colors, especially for the session today. Uh, and, uh, and the main presentation will be done by Joanne Cousineau of the Canada and Revenue Agency. So the presentation will last about 30 or 35 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. This summer, uh, the Canada Revenue Agency published new guidance on CED activities and charitable status. This is the first time CED activities were recognized, uh, the first since CED activities were recognized as potentially charitable in 1999. But since 1999, the field has evolved rapidly with program-related investment, social enterprise, and social finance emerging as innovative practices that left charities wondering about their eligibility. Many of the core elements in the previous guidance have not changed, but the new guidance does clarify several new areas of activity, which hopefully will give greater confidence to charities that are interested in becoming more active in CED-related activities. Before we get into the presentation, though, I just want to do uh, a couple of short polls here to get a sense of who's on the uh, session today. You should see two polls pop up on the screen here inquiring about your charitable status and your main interest in the session. So you can answer those. Um, does your organization have charitable status? Are you thinking of applying for charitable status? Do you work with charities? Or uh, you can choose new, no vote if none of those apply. And then in the other uh, poll question, what's your main interest in today's webinar? Are you a charity and want to know more about the eligibility of CED activities? Are you interested in receiving program-related investments? Or are you interested in making program-related investments or other? And if you have other, you can specify that down in the chat box. So while people are answering, let me introduce our guests. Joanne Cousineau is a senior policy analyst with the Common Law Policy and Public Education section of the Charities Directed at Revenue Canada. We also have Guy Gagnon, who is a senior policy analyst as well, and Christine Tessier, who is a policy technical advisor. Thanks to all three of you for joining us today. Good morning, Michael. Good and morning. everybody else. Welcome. So before I hand it over to you, let's just check in on our poll results. <clears throat> in terms of charitable status, it looks like well, it's just the plurality. If we were doing the first past the post system, plurality of votes there is for organizations that do have charitable status, but a good number that are thinking of it and others that work with charities. And then in terms of interest, uh, it looks like the first choice is the, by far the biggest um, interest. They just want to know more about the eligibility of TED activities, although I think once we talk a bit more about program-related investments, I think there'll be more interest in that. So, uh, Joanne, yes. to get us started, can you briefly explain uh, what you do uh, at the Canada Revenue Agency and the Charities Directorate? Uh, well, um, I'm a senior policy analyst, so when we have a subject that comes up that we think requires a, a guidance document, uh, I, along with my colleagues, we do some research into it. We look at the, uh, the common law that's already there. Uh, and then we try to come up with some guidance that is useful both for our people here internally and for the general public um, uh, and, of course, for charities and organizations who are thinking of applying for registered status. So CRA is, uh, is responsible for uh, tax law primarily, eh? Yes.
do you want to? Uh, oh, oh, we are, okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Jump in. <laughs> we, had, we had a little te technical difficulty and we were blind for a little bit. Now I see okay. that we're, uh, where we are on the slide. Okay. All right, so shall I uh, just get into the presentation? Yeah. All right. So um, just uh, as, as Michael was saying, a few introductory slides to situate ourselves in the CRA. Uh, as most of you know, the Canada Revenue Agency administers the tax laws for the Government of Canada and for most provinces and territories, as well as various social and economic benefits and incentive programs delivered through the tax system. Okay. Next slide. Oh. Here you go. We, we no longer have okay. control of the slides, Michael. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'll see if I can fix that for you. Keep okay. going. All right. So uh, within the CRA, uh, there's the Charities Directorate. Um, and we are responsible for charities, and we have a number of different functions. So we register charities, Canada, Canadian amateur athletic associations, and other qualified donees. We provide information, guidance, and advice on maintaining registered status. We work to ensure that registered organizations comply with registration requirements through a balanced program of education, service, and responsible enforcement. We also develop policy and engage with the charitable sector, other government departments, and other levels of government. Uh, we provide information, communication, and education programs for the charitable sector and for donors. For example, the client service section operates a call center and answers written inquiries. The outreach section offers information sessions, workshops, webinars, and webcasts, such as this one. The charities directorate uh, the Charities and Giving website provides information for registered charities, including uh, our policies and checklists in our forms and publications. In addition, resources that were developed by other organizations with CRA funding are also available on our website. And finally, uh, we have a public education program that provides information that is uh, donor-focused. Uh, so we have a leaf uh, leaflet. Uh, how to Donate Wisely that is available on the CRA website, and it's available in English, French, and also 12 other languages. Mm. 12 other languages? Oh, I guess that reflects the Canadian multicultural context. Eh? Yes, yes, it does. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, can you give us uh, an overview then of what you're going to cover in the presentation today? Okay. Uh, so today's presentation, we're going to review the major changes that resulted from um, our work in revising RC4143, the Community Economic Development uh, Guidance that was uh, published in, in 1999. And we're going to provide an overview of the recently published guidance, CG014, the Community Economic Development Activities and Charitable Registration, which replaced the old guidance. Okay. Um, and so what prompted CRA to uh, come out with this guidance now? Uh, well, there were three major reasons to undertake the revision. Um, first, the, the guide RC4143 was really, it was not intended to be a policy uh, document or a guidance document, but it was intended to be a discussion paper, um, but it ended up on our website. So uh, we wanted to bring, um, bring it in line with our guidance products. Uh, second, the sector's interest in social enterprise continues to grow, and clarification on the rules so to speak, was requested through various channels. And third, we wanted to clarify how CED activities fit within the charity law framework and what the key factors will influence registration for organizations that engage in these types of activities. Excellent. So why don't you start, uh, as a starting point for the session, some of the basic principles uh, behind the guidance. Hi, Michael. I just thought, this is Christine, I just thought I'd let you know we're having uh, uh, difficulties with the system. It keeps logging us out, so I can't advance the presentation. I'm okay. not sure if participants are up to the same page as we are. Um, well, they should be at, uh, we just moved on to key concepts. So I'll, I'll move things forward because, yeah, I'm having trouble Perfect. making you a presenter as well. But Perfect. Thank you. No problem. So the key concepts um, uh, behind the, the guidance that came out this summer. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, Canadian law, being, meaning common law, uh, does not recognize CED as a charitable purpose in and of itself. Uh, the second key concept is that even though CED is not recognized as a purpose, CED activities may be charitable when they directly further a recognized charitable purpose. And the third concept that, that we tried to clarify in the document is the concept of community, uh, specific for this guidance. So 
for this guidance, community can refer to either a geographic location or a group of eligible beneficiaries that share a common characteristic which results in an economic disadvantage. So we wanted to take it beyond just the ge geographical location. Hmm. And so, um, Michael, I believe people are still being able to view only slide 10, and then we're up to slide, um, we're up hmm. to, um, we've advanced in the presentation. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I'm seeing up to slide uh, 13, we just covered the key concepts. Perhaps some people could mention in the chat room just to confirm what slide they're seeing currently. <laughs> <coughs> it, it's because you're saying you're only, uh, you're not seeing the slides advancing, eh, on your computer there, Joanne? No, we're not, and apparently and we can't advance most, either. most other people. Slide 10, yes. <laughs> I know that I'm showing up as a participant right now because I had to re uh, go back into the system. Right. Uh, maybe that is the issue. I tried um, making you a presenter from there, yeah, and it, uh, for some reason it isn't working. So Probably I think well. if people are able to. M Michael, you're not showing as a host right now, so maybe I wonder if that has something to do with it. I suspect. Hmm. Well, maybe it's a problem with my connection here, which would be unfortunate, because now I see that I'm not getting any more uh, chat messages either. Well, we're seeing all the chat messages. Hmm. Uh, we apologize for what's happening. Obviously, yeah. we're having a technical issue. Uh, why don't I will um, uh, log out and log back in, and uh, if you want to keep going then after the, uh, the key concepts, <clears throat> which was um, the, some of the specific changes. Perfect. And I'll uh, see if we can fix, fix this up. Okay, so we can. Okay. All right. So uh, everyone uh, can, I, I think most people can still hear me. And um, so the slides will be available afterwards, uh, yeah. I believe, so people can see them then. So I'll just go on um, with the slides. So now I'm going to speak about the, some of the specific changes that we made to the document before getting into actually discussing the, the various sections of the document. So um, the next four slides, as you'll see when, when they come back up, will highlight some of the specific changes that we made as part of the revisions. And we'll discuss some of them in more detail a bit later. So first, we removed the hard to employ criteria. So the emphasis is now on ensuring that the eligible beneficiary group is broad enough to meet the public benefit requirements. So it is up to the organization to show us how they define the eligible beneficiary group and how that group meets the public benefit requirements. Okay, we do have the slides up now. Yes. Okay. So the next important change is the removal of the restriction on individual development, individual development accounts and microenterprises to relief of poverty purposes only. So uh, if an organization can demonstrate how IDAs and microenterprises further other charitable purposes, the organization may be eligible for registration. Okay, continuing on. Uh, the biggest change to the guidance is the expansion of the program related investment or the PRI section. The section now provides a more detailed explanation of how and when PRIs are acceptable as well as some examples. And as part of the expansion of this section, we also lifted the restriction that PRIs, that required PRIs to be made to qualify donees only. And this is significant because charities will now be able to work with any type of organization to further their charitable purposes, including private for-profit companies rather than the limited pool of organizations that are qualified donees. And again, we'll talk more about PRIs a bit later. Yeah, that's an important change. Yeah, um, so continuing on with this, the changes. Um, so some of the other changes, uh, the, the removal of the section on relieving poverty through the operation of stores. Uh, so this concept is generally covered by the re related business policy, so we wanted to take it out here from, from this one to avoid any uh, duplication or confusion. We also eliminated some of the criteria for social businesses that were irrelevant to furthering the charitable purposes. And we attempted to clarify the fourth category purpose of promoting commerce or industry as it 
related to community economic development activities. Great, and there are two, two final changes? Yeah, and the two final changes. Um, so we changed the term economically challenged community to areas of social and economic deprivation to give some additional recognition to the social issues or concerns that can accompany economic challenges. And we also provided clearer and shorter guidelines on what constitutes a, a deprived area. All right, um, so if I understand correctly, the basic purposes that can be furthered by CED activities and recognized as charitable haven't really changed, right, in the, in these new, uh, in the new guidance? Um, generally not. I mean, the purposes uh, are, are generally the same. We tried to highlight some of the ones that will be more typically furthered by CED activities. Um, so as, as mentioned earlier, CED is not a purpose in and of itself. However, CED activities may further other charitable purposes, and the three examples are relieving poverty by relieving unemployment of the poor, advancing education by providing employment-related training, and uh, benefiting the community in a way the law regards as charitable. And that one is a, the fourth category, is a, is a pretty broad category, and as you'll see in the document, we uh, add to that. So although we've outlined a number of specific purposes in the guidance, this does not mean that these are the only purposes that can be furthered by CED activities. However, they are the most likely ones. Okay, let's go through those more carefully. The first is the activities that relieve unemployment. Right, okay. Um, and because there, is, there isn't one single charitable purpose related to community economic development, um, we have many different activities. We group similar activities into six categories. And as you mentioned, the first one, discuss is activities that relieve unemployment. So as you can see from the guidance, uh, this category has a number of activities, including providing employment-related training, providing career counseling, and providing referral services to appropriate agencies for assistance, among others. And the key point that we wanted to make for this particular um, group of activities uh, is that the eligible beneficiaries must be individuals who are unemployed or facing a real prospect of imminent unemployment and who are shown to need assistance. This means that the charity must be able to show that the people it is serving do not have the necessary skills or resources to find employment on their own, so that they need some additional assistance from the charity. Okay. Um, the second category then you mentioned is employment-related training? Yes. Um, we have identified three different types, what we call employability training, entrepreneurial training, such as how to start a business, and on-the-job training. Uh, and the key points we want to em emphasize here is that employment-related training must not be limited to a spe specific employer. And again, exceptions are possible in areas of social and economic deprivation. Uh, otherwise, it is likely that an unacceptable private benefit is being conferred on that employer if they're focusing solely on one, one employer. And the second key point is that on-the-job training has certain characteristics that, if lacking, will indicate an unrelated business. So these include, for example, that instruction is provided to complement the on-the-job training before or during the on-the-job component, and that the participants are employed for a limited time period. Okay, um, finally there was the question of uh, uh, grants and loans. Okay, yeah, so grants and loans, um, third category, uh, we discussed two types in the document. So individual development accounts are savings accounts that are used only for a specific goal. The charity provides matching funds at a predetermined ratio, for example, a two to one ratio, to help eligible beneficiaries develop savings over a specific period. The individual then uses the amount saved for the agreed upon goal, such as tuition or the purchase of tools. And the second type are loans and loan guarantees. And they could include loans for startup businesses, as well as funds for tuition or tools. And we've outlined the expectations for these types of activities. First, a charity must have a policy or policies that outlines criteria, the criteria and parameters for awarding and terminating individual development accounts and loans and loan guarantees. And second, the charity may only grant, grant the amount needed to achieve the charitable purpose. So if more is granted, it could be considered an undue private benefit. Um, 
And another important change in the new guidance we mentioned earlier was the clarification around program-related investments. Can, can you start by explaining what those are? Okay. Um, so for our purpose, a program-related investment is an activity that directly furthers the investor charity's charitable purpose. And we've identified four common types of PRIs, as you can see on the slide, loans, loan guarantees, share purchases, or lease of land and buildings. So from our perspective, a PRI is not an investment in the conventional financial sense. While PRIs may generate a financial return, they are not made for that reason. And a PRI usually involves the return or potential return of capital, such as funds or property, within a set period of time, but this is not a requirement. Uh, a PRI may also yield additional revenue for the investor charity, such as interest, but the yield of additional revenue can be at below market rate. So this would typically be an investment made, say, for example, by a foundation in a, a local CED type project? Yes, it, it could be. Okay. Yes. So that would be one example. Um, so what are the... Uh, Yes, as you said, PRIs no, are no longer limited to be made only to qualified donees. And by qualified donees, you mean organizations with charitable status? Um, not necessarily. We have, there's a, a list on our website that outlines who, who is a qualified donee uh, and who isn't. Other qualified donees include uh, registered national service arts organizations, municipalities, various levels of government some universities outside Canada, um, and there's others that are listed as well. So it's not just other registered charities or other Canadian registered charities. Um, it, it's more expensive than that. And so now with, with this new guidance, you're opening it up uh, a bit further. Can you talk about the new requirements uh, for uh, PRIs uh, according to the new guidance? Yeah, sure. Um, so the following are the key points. Um, all PRIs must directly further a chari charity's stated charitable purposes. And this is standard for all activities. However, we wanted to highlight the difference between PRIs and regular investments. So if a charity provides startup loans to businesses, they must show how they are furthering their charitable purpose. Startup loans to promote business development, entrepreneurship, or market development are generally not charitable. So it, the charity has to show how a PRI um, furthers a charitable purpose. Um, second, if the PRI is made to a qualified donee, so any of the organization, an organization that falls on within that list, um, there are no other requirements. However, if the PRI is made to a non-qualified donee, the investor charity must prove that the arrangement meets its own activities requirements of the Income Tax Act. So this means that the investor charity must maintain direction and control over the program, and it must be able to show that any private benefit is incidental. So on the next slide, uh, continuing the requirements, uh, the investor charity must ensure that it has appropriate exit mechanisms in place to allow it to either withdraw from the PRI or convert the PRI to a regular investment if the PRI no longer furthers its charitable purposes. For example, uh, a charity may be running a training business that becomes successful and financially viable in its own right, so the investor charity could then restructure the business so that it meets the related business requirements or create an independent business as would be appropriate. The charity should have a written policy or other documentation explaining the relationship of each PRI to its purposes and setting out the criteria or parameters it applies when it's making PRI decisions. And finally, if the PRI involves funding to a non-qualified donee, supporting documentation to establish the necessary direction and control, um, as we've outlined in paragraphs 47 and 48, should form part of the charity's books and records um, for future reference. And the charity must also ensure that the PRIs meet all applicable trust, corporate, and other legal or regulatory requirements. Okay. That's, um that's a lot to digest and uh, maybe a bit technical for some of the people on the call. I just wanted to encourage participants to feel free to pose questions at any time in the chat box and we'll collect those and that'll allow us to move more quickly into the Q&A period once we get there. But uh, 
if you have questions or ideas or comments that jump to mind as we go through this, feel free to post those right away. Um, Joanne, continuing on with the presentation, uh, another type of activity covered by the guidance is social businesses for individuals with disabilities. Yes. Uh, so generally, social businesses for individuals with disabilities are different from on-the-job training, as they seek to provide permanent employment rather than employment for a limited time period. Social businesses must also meet certain criteria in order to be eligible. However, as noted earlier, we removed some of the criteria that were not relevant and made other cr criteria should-haves rather than must-haves. So in all cases, the social business must directly further a charity's stated charitable purpose. Now, the two must-haves in terms of characteristics are as follows. Uh, the workforce is composed entirely of individuals with disabilities, with exceptions for supervisors supervisory staff, and the work is specifically chosen and structured to take into account the special needs of individuals with disabilities in order to relieve conditions associated with those disabilities, which would normally prevent the individuals from being able to work. Um, and the next slide, we talk about the two should have the two characteristics for social businesses uh, that we would like to see. Uh, it is expected that some associated job-related training that enhances the general skills of the eligible beneficiaries be incorporated into the programs, and second, that the eligible beneficiaries be involved in a significant way in managing and making decisions for the social businesses. And uh, just a note there, if we have, as we have on the slide, for this policy, uh, we are using the Canadian Human Rights Act definition of disability which recognizes any previous or existing mental or physical disability and includes disfigurement and previous or existing dependence on alcohol or a drug. So the definition is, is fairly broad, and the, uh, the organization um, will provide us the information on how they're defining, defining their eligible beneficiary group. Interesting. Um, community land trusts are also covered in the new guidance? Yes, um, they're covered very briefly. Um, so generally, a community land trust is set up to ensure that land will continue to be available for the benefit of the community. For example, an organization could purchase a piece of land to be used as a commun communal vegetable garden in an urban area. Uh, generally, community land trusts operate by developing properties and leasing them to eligible beneficiaries. For example, an organization could create a community land trust by leasing a building to provide housing for individuals who are poor or who have a disability. And as with other activities, a community land trust must directly further a charity's stated charitable purpose and not simply be a traditional investment. And other than that, uh, there were really no significant changes to this section. Okay. Um, the guidance also provided clarification around activities that promote commerce or industry. Yes. Um, promoting a particular industry or trade will only be charitable if doing so results in a charitable benefit being provided to the public or a sufficient segment of the public. So examples of types of purposes that could enhance an industry as a whole and potentially deliver a charitable public benefit include those that promote a greater, greater efficiencies within an industry if those efficiencies benefit the general public. Another potential example is uh, promote or facilitate the achievement or preservation and maintenance of high standards of practice within an industry, if doing so benefits the general public. And what we're asking for uh, is objective evidence to determine whether a benefit to the public will result from promoting an industry. And um, the non-expert opinions of the founders, directors, trustees, members, or supporters of the organization um, will be taken into consideration, but we will need some additional information. It's not sufficient in terms of object objective evidence, is what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so finally, the new guidance uses a different term, areas of social and economic deprivation, which is a change from uh, economically challenged community in the previous uh, uh, guidance, guidance. Yes. And, and again, I think I mentioned before that we wanted to um, uh, also have some recognition for the social impact uh, and and the social concerns uh, that can sometimes arise in, in economically challenged communities. So we wanted to have that recognized in the title. Um, 
So generally deprived areas have one or more of the following characteristics at 1.5 times the national average. So unemployment for two or more cons consecutive years, crime, including family violence, health problems, including mental health issues, drug and alcohol addiction, and suicide, and children and youth at risk, so children who are taken into care or dropping out of school. Now, in these areas, special considerations relating to the assessment of private benefit are generally allowed. For example, a charity that wishes to provide health care services in a remote area and needs to recruit health care professionals from other areas could offer such things as higher pay or reduced clinic overhead to attract health care providers, provided the incentives are not unreasonable. Okay, so uh, in closing then, you wanted to provide some clarification regarding the terms and definitions used. Um, there was a link to a two-page uh, list of terms and definitions that was included in the email reminder that was sent to people just this morning, I believe, and it's also available on the, the website. Okay, um, yeah, those, so those, the, I think those definitions were um, we're there to help people understand some of the terminology that we're going to be talking about, that, that we talked about here. Um, the definitions, the terms and definitions that um, we put in the guidance, um, Appendix A was a last minute addition uh, because there are many terms related to CED and multiple definitions for each one. So we were initially reluctant to add any to the document itself. However, uh, it was decided that some terms would be helpful to situate the reader and provide some context. So we hopefully made it clear that the definitions were for reference only and would not be used as a determining factor in any registration or auditing processes. So if you see from the guidance, we provided uh, definitions for the following terms for community economic development, social enterprise, social finance, and community capacity building. And again, they were not uh, our definitions, um, but, but we took some from uh, what we thought were reliable sources and added them to the document in an appendix for reference purposes. Excellent. Okay, well, congratulations, Joanne, on getting through a, a lot of material in, uh, in 30 minutes. That was a, a very uh, a good overview presentation, and I'm sure people will have uh, questions. There's actually there's three that have already come up there in the chat room. We have some time for questions and answers now, about 20 or 25 minutes. But here on the slide you see is uh, the contact information for CRA for people who have general inquiries after the session. Then, um, so now we'll move into the question and answer period and invite participants to type questions uh, into the chat box. Uh, the questions, I'm sure, will be pretty wide-ranging because the guidance is very uh, comprehensive. And what I will do now is uh, unsync the presentation so that uh, participants, people on the call, you should be able to scroll through the presentation yourself back and forth to revisit particular slides that you want to see again, some of the details. and. Um, and we'll go ahead with the questions now. So uh, the first question, Jeff Loomis from Momentum in Calgary asked uh, a question regarding individual development accounts. How is the requirement of granting only uh, to the amount of charitable purposes determined? All right, I'm going to appeal that one and be speaking. Please, E. All right. Um, the way you have to look at an individual development account for a ch from the charity's perspective is whenever a charity can outright transfer money to an individual um, to fulfill a charitable purpose, um, the charity can engage in providing an individual development account. So whatever amount of cash the charity would normally be able to transfer to the individual would be the amount uh, or the maximum of that uh, individual development account. And the charity has to look at a number of factors. First of all, the purpose under which it falls. Uh, if it's relieving poverty, advancing education, or one of the fourth head purposes, etc. So under relief of poverty, an organization would have to look at how much would um, the amount of the individual uh, development account uh, be to relieve this particular condition that's being looked at. And then decide what ratio it wants to um, 
uh, participate in that uh, account, as well as for what period of time it wants to uh, enter into uh, an agreement with uh, the individual that's um, saving over a period of time. Um, then the, the charity also has to look at um, things like exit mechanisms in case over a lengthy period of time, the individual no longer needs the, um, the, the charitable relief being provided, and at what point in time the, um, the relief exceeds the bounds of charity. So the charity should have selection criteria for both its beneficiaries and identify the needs that are being um, relieved and the point at which um, relief exceeds the bounds of charity. So it's, it, there's a bunch of factors to look at and what's reasonable for the, the individual charity and the individuals that they're assisting are all going to be looked at. So there's no one answer that fits all situations, but it, it all has to do with the, uh, the the situation of the charity and the individuals being assisted. Hmm. Is, is there um, a more specific guidance or would it... I know some of these questions are going to get into specifics and they, they aren't things we'll be able to answer on the call here today, but I'm just wondering if people want to move forward, should they be consulting with lawyers or following up the CRA directly um, in terms of getting more specific answers? Because as you say, there's a lot of variables. There, there's a lot of variables, but it, often charities all, already have a lot of this information in their mission statements. When they've applied for charitable status, they've had to explain their programs to us. For instance, if they're uh, assisting um, poor children by buying computers, or uh, things of that nature. They've already shown to us the criteria they're going to use for selecting um, their beneficiaries. They've, also, they've already got programs in place where they, they refer to, uh, let's say, government agencies for what the poverty cutoffs are under poverty, or if they're assisting with the tuition, what the, the tuition is in a certain area or for different schools. Under advancement of education, of course, the, the criteria are different because if you're um, if you're helping to advance education, the criteria are based on academic performance and achievement. They're not. Uh, they're no longer based on relieving poverty. So organizations with all of these questions, when it comes to specific questions, they can always contact uh, the charity's director to make sure that they're uh, complying with the Income Tax Act and to get our advice on things. And that's what we're here for, and we're uh, happy to help uh, in any way we can. Excellent. Okay, um, let's move on to the next question from Alan Day in Ontario. Um, this, this sounds like it should be a simple question, uh, and I think, I'm not sure, Joanne, if you mentioned this, but the change in term for social and economic deprivation, does that refer specifically to geographic areas? Uh, it can, but it's not necessarily uh, limited to geographic areas. Um, again, um, it, it relates back to the concept of community. So what we would like is the organization um, can define the community or the area that, that they're serving. And it can be both geographic uh, or taking into account uh, a specific group of eligible beneficiaries, or it can be one or the other. Um, so that was, I think, one of the changes that we made. It's, we're not looking necessarily now at very specific boundaries of only um, um, like only a, a very uh, area that, that you know you can define geographically like a city or a town. Uh, so it could be even within, for example, Toronto, it could be a, a smaller area within Toronto um, where there's a group of eligible beneficiaries that would need some extra assistance. So okay, I, and is there any constraints with respect to the scale, like a, a minimum size of either geographic or um, or community of interest or identity or uh, need and either and is in terms of the biggest possible or the smallest that you can't go beyond or? the it, it really depends on the purpose okay um, and it, it all has to do with the public benefit test and what's defined as efficient uh, sufficient sufficient segment of the population um, under advanced or under relief of poverty, that can be a, a fairly small segment of the population. Um, so, as in maximum, no. The, usually, the broader your program is, the uh, the better for for your uh, for your purpose. 
However, when you're trying to define an area of social economic deprivation, as we've seen with the statistics for uh, community, um, if you go too large, uh, you you might not be able to uh, define your community as in special need. So as long as you can define that your community is in special need of, uh, or, or meets the definition for community economic deprivation, it, that's what you're looking for. Okay. Um, we have one more question from Russ in Winnipeg here, and then if others have questions you want to, to pose, feel free to post them uh, in the chat box and we'll get to them. But from Russ, Russ Rothney in Winnipeg, do you have examples of charitable organizations or foundations that are providing financial assistance to non-qualified donees in the context of the CED program guidelines? Hmm. Okay, uh, the questions, uh, I'll answer it in two parts. The, sure. Because of the confidentiality provisions of the Income Tax Act, we can't necessarily name foundations or charities that are, that would be providing such assistance. Sure. Um, and, and on the second part, it's not that charities are providing financial assistance to non-qualified donees, but they're working through non-qualified donees to carry out their own program. So the program-related investment ends up being the program of the charity, uh, and we do, and there are many charities that are um, engaged in working with non-qualified donees to carry out their own programs. Okay. And we do have uh, some examples in in the generic examples in the policy itself that that try to illustrate uh, some some possibilities there. I mean, it it, uh, it would have been nice if we could have put several more pages of examples. However, we didn't want to try and keep the policy at a manageable length. So, um, but we do have a few examples in there. And it, and perhaps you can correct me though, but when we're talking about PRIs, is that similar to what's also referred to as mission-based investing by, um, by charities, for example, or foundation? Because I'm just thinking one example of uh, in the task force on social finance report that came out two years ago, one of their calls was to encourage foundations to become more involved in uh, impact investing and mission-based investing. And uh, the report that they put out a year later, I think, identified a number of foundations that have become more active in that field. But uh, I think those might be uh, sp more specifically to qualified donees rather than um, non-qualified donees, given that this guidance just came out this summer, opening up the, uh, the possibility for investment to non-qualified donees. Right? There, there's still a lot of confusion in that area, but usually when we're speaking about mission-based investing, it's investing at fair market rates where you don't have to have, uh, they're, they're the regular investments of a charity okay. in market-type investments, so they don't have to be with qualified donees or non-qualified donees. The charity is just expecting a fair market rate of return. However, the businesses or the individuals that they're investing in at fair market rates of return have similar missions or values to the charity itself. Now, that can be imported, uh, or the philosophy can be imported to program-related investments, and they should because the program-related inve investments should be uh, uh, directly furthering the, uh, the programs of the charity itself. So there, there's a bit of a... Uh, the interlap there, but uh, mission-based investment uh, has a different connotation. Thanks. Thank you. Paul's question for CED uh, initiatives or activities that promote commerce or industry, what's the difference between focusing on advancing the interests of community members and advancing the interests of an industry as a whole? For example, providing sanitary facilities in a remote area benefits the public and enhances the agriculture industry, but it will also necessarily help individual farmers. Any comments on that uh, reflection? I guess it's the main point is the distinguishing it's the public benefit test that you were mentioning earlier, right? That's correct. As long as ultimately the main beneficiary are the public, we know that incidentally or along the way, there's going to be some private benefit that accrues to uh, individual farmers in this example or businesses. But it, it's the ultimate objective that we're looking at. If, if the benefit is for the public and not um, in, incidentally to the, uh, or sorry, if ultimately the benefit, the net benefit is for the public, it should pass the test. 
Um, if uh, any of these questions or the responses don't necessarily uh, answer the, the questions, feel free to post uh, clarifying or follow-up questions in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll get back to them. Lori Stewart had a question. Uh, they've applied for charitable status with purposes that are related to community education but not necessarily linked to employment. Uh, CRA suggested changing the purposes to fit with the CED guideline. They don't see themselves fitting CED the way it's been defined by these purposes. Are there other ways to qualify as a charity that aren't related to CED? Hmm. Well, it really depends um, what type of education, community education the organization is doing. Um, we, we're going to have some new guidance products that are going to come out in the near term on um, promotion of health and protection of the environment and other topics where we speak about dissemination of information and community education. Now, these are activities. They're not purposes in and of themselves. And if we go back to a decision called Vancouver Society of Immigration and Visible Minority Women, when we look at an activity, we have to look at the purpose the activity aims to achieve. And as long as it can be shown that the community education is likely to achieve a charitable purpose, the community education can be viewed as a charitable activity. Um, and without knowing exactly what community education the organization is trying to attempt, it's hard to decipher if it's going to be considered a charitable activity or not, but there are possibilities. Thanks. Um, Teresa uh, has a question here that I think has been on the mind of a lot of our members who are active in uh, social enterprise activities, is that whether or not CED charities now uh, have greater leeway to, whether this guidance provides greater leeway in terms of working with social enterprise or starting up a social enterprise. Um, how, does this guidance um, provide any more specifics around the rules related to social enterprise for and charitable status? Um, well, I'm not sure if we had any rules uh, really around social enterprise before. Um, what it does do is um, I mean, the restriction in terms of PRIs uh, that, that we used to have where you can only use qualified donees, um, that has been lifted. So there's certainly uh, a lot more flexibility now for charities who engage in community economic development and uh, or social enterprise type activities. Um, again, we still expect all of these activities to further the charitable purposes. Uh, and that there's no um, undue private benefit or the private benefit remains incidental. So um, the new guidance does open up uh, additional possibilities in the way that, that charities can uh, further their charitable purposes. Um, but I'm not sure really for, for organizations that are not charities, uh, I'm not sure if it has any impact uh, whatsoever unless they are going to work with uh, a charitable organization. Yeah, I know um, in one of the commentaries we have in the resource section of the uh, page on our website for this webinar is uh, a commentary that was prepared by David LePage with uh, uh, another lawyer in Vancouver. The, the conclusion uh, from their analysis of the, the guidance and the, the rules or the, the guidance these days around this issue is that it was what you said, I think, was that Joanne? Yes. Sorry, Joanne, is that as long as the social enterprise furthers the objects of the charity and the charitable purposes, then uh, it, sh it should be fine. And if it doesn't, then you, you need to spin it off or separate it out. Uh, it shouldn't be part of the, the charitable, uh, it's not part of the charitable activities. It shouldn't be part of the charity's uh, organization activities. Yes. Very good. Um, so we have just a, a few minutes left for uh, a final couple of questions. I see uh, Teresa and Jeff are typing, but we don't, uh, don't see any other questions at this point. <clears throat> so perhaps what we'll, uh, what we'll do is uh, just one uh, quick question from me, you, you mentioned, E, I think that there's further guidance coming out related to public health and other um, 
and other topics. Do you anticipate any further work related to DED, social finance, impact investing in this field? Uh, or how do you see CRA's activities on this front uh, moving forward? Is there a review coming up on this one? Is there going to be a one-year review? Yeah. Okay. Um, when, uh, I, I, when we release a, a new guidance or revised guidance, we have a, an objective of um, a year or so after the guidance is put out to review the guidance to see what feedback we've gotten from the public, from our own officers, et cetera, to see if it's uh, helpful to the charity sector in here or any improvements we can do to the guidance. So probably in a year's time or so, we're going to start reviewing this document to see um, any changes that can be made to it or if any need to be made. Um, and as far as other related products, I don't see any on topic right now. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, so we have two last questions here, and then I'll uh, wrap it up from Teresa and, uh, and Jeff. And this uh, comes back to the social enterprise question, uh, another technical issue for, uh, from Teresa. Can uh, community economic development or an organization with charitable status for TED-related activities derive a return on investment from a social enterprise? Could a charity on education? I think, are you reading uh, Teresa's question there? Is this your second question? Yes, the, the one that's uh, is close to the end there. Can a CED initiative derive a return on investment from a social enterprise? Yes, it can. Okay. As long as the social enterprise is the, um, the main charitable activity of an organization. Right. Uh, for example, um, let's say the social enterprise is a, uh, is a restaurant business. Where the, and they're charging for meals or whatever at the business, you can have a, a certain return on your investment in that uh, instance. Excellent. And uh, the final question from Jeff, uh, related to education. Could a charity with education in its charitable objects offer employment training focused on advancing education rather than relieving unemployment? Yes. As long as the uh, there's a tie-in between the uh, the program and the education, for instance, co-op placements for students, etc. Excellent. Uh, Guy, you're just r rattling off the answers there, so that's uh, very <laughs> yeah, very good. Okay, well, um, with that, we're just about out of time now, so I will uh, resync the presentation get everyone back towards the, uh, the question and discussion page. And um, we've covered a lot of gro ground on the presentation. Everyone who is registered for the webinar should have just received an email with a link to a one-minute evaluation survey. If you don't mind, just to open that up and take a second to fill it out right now. Your feedback is very important to us. And one question in that survey is whether you'd be interested in a follow-up webinar with um, legal expertise or just a Q&A session to go a bit more into detail on some of the specific issues or questions that you might have. So if there's enough demand, if people feel that it would be useful to have a follow-up session, we'll organize that, but we'll need to see that the interest in the, in the survey. So please take a minute to fill that out. It's also, your feedback is also important because there will be war, more webinars like this one starting in the new year. So if you have suggestions for other topics, feel free to share them with us and watch for information about upcoming sessions. Our winter and spring schedule will be launched, will be launched shortly and we'll send you a follow-up email when the topics and dates are set. So a very big thank you to uh, Joanne, Guy, Christine, and the team at the Canada Revenue Agency for taking us through the complex world of charitable status and the new guidance. There on the slide you see um, links for more information, including uh, all of the, the definitions, the full guidance, and other resources that were on the webinar page of uh, our website, and a link to subscribe to SEDNET's newsletters for more information on this and other topics. And thank you to all the participants for uh, joining us for the session. Um,
looks like uh, we're wrapping things up in the, in the chat room there. So the formal portion of the webinar will end here. I'll leave the chat room open for a bit if people want to share final comments and ideas. But thank you to everyone for joining us, and have a terrific day. Thank you, Michael, thank you, for Michael. joining us. Thank you. Thanks.